look at um, how the gospel addresses shame. There's a picture in the world where right and wrong is not as predominant as something that you do is questioned whether it's honorable or shameful. Parts of the world that don't think about telling the truth is right or telling the truth is telling lies are wrong. There are parts where you say is determined why what you do, is it honorable to your family or dishonorable to your family? And it's based on what it does for your family, what it does for your tribe, what it does for your community, what it does to bring honor to you and the people around you. In those kinds of situations, you start to ask, how in the world can you share the gospel with people like that? If you have a Western mindset of the gospel where the gospel is about our guilt and how God removes our guilt, and our, it's a legal understanding of salvation, where we see the gospel as addressing our guilt for the wrongs we've done, then we become frustrated thinking, how do we even begin to share the gospel with people who don't see right and wrong necessarily as much as honor and shame? And I don't think you'll be surprised to find that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, shame and honor are predominant themes from the very beginning of the Old Testament. God is delivering his people out of slavery into freedom of the promised land, restoring their honor. And he's at the end of the Old Testament. God is taking them from exile back to their home, restoring their honor. And when you get to the first century, to Jesus, you see Jesus going into a society where the honor and the shame of a tribe or honor or shame of an individual is based on your family, based on your money, based on your wealth based on your education. And this is still alive and well in many cultures even today. So how does the gospel speak to this? If you're here this morning and you've dealt with shame, how does the gospel speak to you? That's what I want to dive into this morning. And I don't want us to be ignorant as to think that honor and shame are just in terms that are reserved for overseas different cultures. How does the gospel speak to this picture of honor And then we're going to look at a bunch of different texts throughout the New Testament this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Luke 4 is where we're going to be. I'm going to focus on just one, two verses here in Luke 4. I'm going to follow a very similar pattern to what we did a couple weeks ago. Luke 4, I'm going to go from verse 14 down. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then scrolled up the scroll, he then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. This is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, accounts of a synagogue service. Synagogue services would usually begin with prayer and a blessing, followed by a recital of Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, and then they would have a reading from the law and then a reading for the prophets. Those would be read where everyone is standing up, and then usually whoever is teaching would sit down, everyone else would stand, and he would expound on one or both of the texts. So this is a picture of Jesus reading from the prophets. And then he sits down and he begins to share. He says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And that's a bold statement to make for Jesus. He's quoting from Isaiah 61. He brings in the picture of the release of the oppressed, which we'll get to in our time together today. But what I want you to see is this theme statement, a summary passage of the entire ministry of Jesus. Jesus is saying, this is why I came for. This is why I'm here. God sent me to preach good news to the poor. God sent me to, to proclaim freedom for prisoners, to recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is why I came. He is the fulfillment of all of these things in the Old Testament. I want you to think about this bold statement in terms of two lines. First of all, I want you to think about how Jesus is proclaiming to be able to reverse our status. He's able to reverse 
our status. See the picture of honor and shame throughout these verses in Luke 18, Luke 4, 18 and 19. You've got pictures of shame, right? There's the poor, there's the prisoners, there's the blind, there's the oppressed. These are pictures of shame in the first century. And then you've got pictures of honor. Good news. There's freedom. There's restoration of sight. There's release for the oppressed. You've got honor and shame bundled together in these two verses. Now, it's interesting. If you lived in the first century in Jesus' time, it's a very layered, stratified society. You see this all throughout the pages of the New Testament. There are different groups of people living in that century. Most of the honor and shame that you have was inherited. It's ascribed to you. It's given to you. You were born into it. You were born into a certain class of people. Or you may try to do some things to gain more honor, or you may do some stuff that causes more shame, but you're pretty much stuck in that class. Very similar to the Hindu caste system that's predominant in India for many, many years. In India, there are a group of people called the Dalits, which are the untouchables. There's no hope for them ever getting out of that caste. No matter how hard they work, there's no dream of them ever elevating themselves to a higher status. That's where you are, and that's where you stay. At the same time, there are higher castes. And if you're one of them, then you belong to those people. The picture in the first century is very similar. You were born into certain groups. You have a certain amount of shame and honor that's bestowed upon you. And this is where you are in life. And so what Jesus is doing, he's coming on the scene and saying, I have the power to reverse your status, to reverse your caste, so to speak. He says, I have the power to take the poor and bring good news to them. I have the power to take those who are oppressed and release them. I have the power to take those who are prisoners and set them free. What Jesus is saying is, I've come to reverse the status that the world has given you. I want you to see this illustrated in five different stories this morning. I want you to see briefly each of these stories unfold. And I want us to think about a few different facets in each of these stories. First of all, the reversal that's going to happen from this to that. And then I want us to see how this relates to people of all time and what Jesus is saying to us. Turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. This is the first story. It's an incredible story. And see this picture illustrated here, how Jesus reverses our status. Luke 5 verse 12 says, While he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus, fell face down, and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately... The leprosy left him. And then he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Here's a reversal I want you to see in this passage. This man comes with leprosy to Jesus, and Jesus reverses his status from being dirty to being clean. From being dirty to being clean. You've got to understand the context here. When you go back to the Old Testament and you look at Leviticus 13, Leviticus 14, you see some pretty stringent rules laid down for those who had leprosy. Leprosy was obviously a physical condition. It was a skin disease. Leprosy in many cases was not curable at all. And so what you have is this man with leprosy coming to Jesus. This is not just a physical condition, but it was also a social condition. Leprosy was not just a disease, it was a dreaded contagious disease. You were filthy. You were repugnant. You were repulsive to the people around you. You couldn't go near to people. And if you did, if you came near to someone, you would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, for everyone to know that you were around. You had to let them know that you were near them so that they could stay as far away from you as possible. Many people believed you couldn't let a leper into your house because your house would become contaminated. You wouldn't want to walk where a leper walked because of what it might do to you. And you can only imagine the effects that it has on a leper, the social effects, the psychological effects, the spiritual effects of this on someone's life. You can never go into a temple, so that means you are isolated and separated from God your entire life. This was a horrible disease. And this story of Jesus healing this leper is not a picture of healing like we've seen in other places in Jesus' life ministry. In fact, when you read these verses... You don't even see the word healed mentioned at all. But you see the idea of cleansing mentioned over and over. 
So you didn't need to just be healed of leprosy. You needed to be cleansed. You were filthy, repulsive, disgusting. That's the situation that this guy's in. He's able to do nothing about it. He can't go to anyone. He's lost everything. His name, his family, his occupation, his reputation. He's lost everything. Any interaction with people is gone. Now I want you to see the message here from dirty to clean. Jesus is going to speak to all of us who are helpless. Feel the weight of this man's condition as he approaches Jesus. See the boldness of his move. He comes to Jesus, and instead of keeping his distance, he falls down at the feet of Jesus. He bows and he honors Jesus. And listen to what he says. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, think about that statement for a second. This man isn't doubting whether Jesus has the power to heal him. He knows that Jesus has the power to heal him. What he doubts is if Jesus wants to heal him. Here's a guy who's lived his entire life with everybody ignoring him. And now he's crying out, would you just pay attention to me? Would someone give me attention? But what does Jesus do? Instead of turning from him, Jesus turns to him. That in and of itself is different from anyone else in that culture. Not only does Jesus turn to him, Jesus reaches out his hands and touches the man. Listen, don't miss the beauty of the gospel in that verse. In that time, if you touch a leper, you defile yourself. You run the risk of taking leprosy on yourself. Jesus doesn't keep his hands back behind his back and say, hey, be healed. He doesn't do that. Instead, he reaches out and touches the man right at the point of helplessness. You can imagine the shock on this man's face when he feels someone else's hand on his left body. When nobody else would even get near him, now all of a sudden, the God of the universe is touching him. Jesus says, I'm willing be clean. The leper realizes that this man is willing to risk taking defilement upon himself so that he could be clean. That sound familiar? Jesus would be willing to take defilement on himself this morning so that you and I could be clean. Jesus says to all of us who are helpless, I will restore you. He says, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Those words, be clean, is two words in English, but in the Greek it was only one word. Jesus says one word, and immediately the leprosy leaves him. And Luke emphasizes how he was covered in leprosy, and now immediately it's gone. He's able to go to the temple and offer his sacrifice and go to the priest and say, hey, look at me. I look a lot different from what last time you saw me, right? And this is Jesus. He's completely restored. His whole life is restored with one simple word from Jesus. Jesus takes on our dirtiness. He takes on our filth in that which is repulsive and he makes us clean and that's huge. And I don't want to limit this to how this speaks to people in honor of shame cultures. So I was reading through this story this week and praying about it this week. I couldn't help but think that there are many of us in our own community who come here this morning and there are things in your life and things in your past that have made you feel untouchable, feel dirty whether it's something you've done that you really wish you hadn't, that you could forget, or sins that you struggled with, that you wish you could wipe out completely from your mind, or maybe it's things that have been done to you that you couldn't control, and you were helpless then, and for whatever reason now, for years you felt the dirt and the filth and that have just pervaded your life. I want you to remind you by the authority of the Word of God that Jesus looks at you and says, I'm willing to take your defilement upon myself, and when I do that, I will Will make you whole and restore you again. Jesus doesn't turn from you in your shame. He turns to you in your shame. He reaches out to you and he says, I will restore you. To all of us who are helpless, he says, I will restore you. From dirty to clean. Second story, go over a few chapters to Luke 7. Look at me at verse 36. Jesus, we've seen Jesus reverses our status from dirty to clean, but look at this passage. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in that town who was a sinner found out 
that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster bar, jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them, anointing them with the perfume. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, Say it, teacher. A creditor has two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they couldn't pay it back, he generously forgave them both. So which of them would love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who forgave, I suppose the one he forgave more. You judge correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loves much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus takes us from being dirty to being clean. But secondly, Jesus takes us from being rejected to being accepted. From being rejected to being accepted. Get this scene. This woman is watching this meal take place. It was a pretty common thing in that day and time that people who weren't invited to a meal like this with important religious leaders to stand around and watch. And maybe if there were leftovers at the end, they would get some crumbs from the table afterwards. So here's this woman relegated to the sidelines. And all of a sudden, she intrudes on the scene and kneels at the feet of Jesus and lets down her hair. This is a woman who's been known for her living. We don't know exactly what she's done, but most likely it's along the lines of prostitution or something that was a very public picture of her sin, a very public picture where her sin was known for. Here she's bowing at the feet of Jesus, pouring perfume at his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And immediately Simon, the Pharisee, reacts and he thinks, wait a minute, first of all, a woman and a Jewish rabbi would never been seen reacting like this in public. Then second, Jesus claims to be a prophet, and if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was. And he would know all the sins that she has done, and she would know, he would know her reputation, and he would never allow this to happen to him. And so Simon concludes that Jesus isn't a prophet because of the way that Jesus is responding to this woman. She's lived in a culture where she's completely rejected by the sin that pervades her life. She comes on the scene and she's wondering, what's going to happen when she, does to when she does this to Jesus? I want you to see the picture here to all of us who are hurting. To all who are relegated on the sideline because of your sin, by your reputations, by the things that you can or cannot control. Jesus says, I receive you. I receive you. Nobody there thought that this woman should be allowed at the table except Jesus. Nobody else wanted her there, except Jesus. Now listen, don't miss the, miss the beauty of this picture. It's not a picture of this woman getting her things right in her life, and then maybe she could be allowed into the presence of Jesus. That's not what this passage is teaching us at all. This passage is teaching us about a woman who is known for her sinfulness, who obviously had a change of heart and trusted Jesus. He says later to her, your faith has healed you. Not what she did healed her, but her faith healed her. She was trusting in Jesus to receive her. So she comes into his presence with all of her baggage still in her life. And Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. He restores her. She says, I will receive you and I will take your hurts and I will take the pains that you've experienced in your life as a result of the sin and I will overcome it by receiving you and my grace will transform your life and that's good news. That's good news. 
for all of us in this room, no matter how storied our past may be, no matter how, what we've done, even this past week in our lives, it is important to realize that coming to Jesus doesn't mean getting our act together and getting everything right and then coming to Jesus. We come to Jesus with all the filth of our lives and His grace transforms us through and through. This is not a performance-based salvation where we do this and we do that in order to accept, receive God's favor, but we have received God's favor simply because of the work of Jesus on the cross. By His grace, He says, I'll receive you. All right, next story, Luke 15. Luke 15 is a very familiar passage. Probably more familiar than all the other stories. Luke 15, 11. I want you to look at verses 11 through 24 and picture the scene with me. Jesus is describing the love of his father. Verse 11, he also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had, traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. And he went to work for one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed the fig, pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. And so he got up and went to his father, and while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I forgive. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and then bring the cat and cow and slot slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive now. Again, he was lost and is found, so be they began to celebrate. Jesus takes us from dirty to clean. Jesus takes us from being rejected to accepted. The third thing I want you to see is Jesus takes us from being lost to being found. From being lost to being found. We know this story. It's very familiar to us. The son goes to the father where he's still alive and says, I want my share of the estate and I want it now. He was entitled to this once the father died. And so with his actions, he's literally by saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could get whatever I want. And it's a huge shame that he's putting on his father. And so he runs off, he squanders it. And he finds himself working in a pigsty and he's jealous of what the pigs are eating. This is not a good situation to be in. And he comes to himself one day and he says, I wonder if I could go back home. And so he gets together his speech. He knows what he's going to say. And he heads home. And when he gets close to his house, he starts wondering, what's his father going to do? How's his father going to react? And as soon as the father sees him, he comes running out to his son. Now listen, this is an incredible picture. First of all, the fact that the father has been waiting on his son and saw him when he was afar is incredible. It's a beautiful picture. No matter how far you and I wander, we have a Father who waits. We have a God who never gives up on us. However, then the Father runs. The Father runs. This is a big cultural surprise in the parable to see the Father running. This is the only time in Scripture we see God in a hurry. The father is running after the son. Now you've got to ask, why is the father running to the son? Obviously out of love for the son, but also, but also because he wants to show his affections to his son. But, not, but it's even deeper than that. I want to take you back to the Old Testament for a second, back to Deuteronomy 21. I want to let this passage transform your understanding of the parable of the Good Samaritan, of the, of the prodigal son. Look at verse 18. Why did the father run? Why did he throw his arms around him? This is literally the Greek, the father tackles the son. I mean, he went after him. Why did he do that? Listen to this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them even when they discipline him, his father and mother are to take a hold of him 
bring him to the elders of his city, to the gates of his hometown. They will say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. And all the men of the city will stone him to death. You must purge the evil from you, and all Israel will hear and be afraid. Did you catch that? This is pretty intense. Remember honor and shame? That's the picture here. The son is now bringing honor to the family. He is shaming his family. And this is what the law says. So the father, when he sees his son coming back to him running, he runs to him. Why? Because the law says a son that has brought this kind of shame on the family is worthy to be stoned. And this father goes running after the son and says, basically he's saying, if anyone is going to stone him, he's got to get through me first. He's got to get through me first. The father covers him so that if anyone tries to hurt him, they would only get the father instead. Don't miss the beauty of the gospel right there. To all of us who feel hopeless, who feel that God could never forgive you, that God can never bring you back because of this or because of that, to all of us who feel hopeless, Jesus says, I will rescue you. There's a God who is in a, hurry, in a hurry to rescue his people. Even when we have brought complete shame on ourselves and even on the name of Jesus, he rushes to restore the honor. He says, put a robe on him. Put a ring on him. Put sandals on his feet. He is not a slave. He is free in this house. Let's celebrate. Let's party. What should have been a funeral turned into a feast because of God who rescues his people from their sins. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been so immersed or so engrossed in your sin that you feel completely hopeless. You feel like you're never able to get out of it. Or maybe there are people you love or care for that may be in a situation like this right now. I want you to remind you that we serve a God who rescues his people from sin and the things of this world. He rescues us from the shame that sin brings. Two more stories over Luke 16. This is a parable that has two parts. We're going to look at the first part, Mark, uh, Luke 16, verse 19. There's a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. And instead, the dogs would come and lick the sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being tormented in hates, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony and this flame. Abraham said, son, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. I want you to see how Jesus takes us from being poor to being rich. There's a huge reversal in this passage. The passage starts with a contrast between Lazarus and this rich man. The, the rich man is dressed in purple, a representation of all the wealth that he had in this world. He had everything you could want, everything you could dream for. And then you have Lazarus who could do nothing but sit there. And he has his ulcers, his sores, and he's being licked by dogs. They're the only ones who cared about him. What a horrible picture of poverty for Lazarus. However, when they both die, everything is reversed. You've got Lazarus enjoying the feast at Abraham's side. And you've got this rich man who's now in torment and pain. And it says four different times in uneasing agony. There's a chasm that will never, ever be crossed. This is a picture of how Jesus takes us from being poor to being rich. Throughout the book of Luke, we see a lot of emphasis on poverty and what Jesus does in the middle of poverty. But listen, this is not just a story about physical poverty. It's, about a, it's also a story about spiritual poverty. It's about a dependence on God. Don't miss this. The story isn't to say that Oh, if you're poor economically in this world, then you'll be rich in heaven. Or if we're wealthy economically in this world, we'll be poor in heaven and we'll go to hell. That's not what this passage is teaching here at all. After all, Abraham, who we see in the story, was a very wealthy man. 
He is rich next, he is right there next to Lazarus. This picture, though, is a poverty of the dependence of, on God, of trust in God. I think it does have something to do with our economic level. You go to some parts of the world, especially overseas parts, into some impoverished areas, and you see the faith of people when they have nothing and how they worship God in the midst of poverty. It puts some of us to shame when we have so much and we gripe and we complain and we bicker, right? Often we have more than majority of the people in this world and yet we're, we can complain about, man, the smallest of smallest things. And there are people in parts of the world that they don't have anything. I remember going to Kenya, going, standing there and we're like, hey, we're going to church. And we all walk out to go to church and we're meeting under a tree. There's no sound system. There's no AC. There's no instruments. There's no mic for the preacher. There's no pulpit for the preacher to put his Bible in. There, in fact, the people don't even have Bibles. And yet the joy in their faces when they worship Jesus put me to shame. Because here I was complaining about, man, the AC wasn't working or I don't, I don't have this or that. I think it does speak somewhat to an economic level, but there's some things about us that we complain too much about because we really don't understand the blessings that God has given us. When you come back to our sitting here, you have to realize that in our culture, it's very easy for us to become dependent on things instead of becoming dependent on God. So we have this transition from being poor to being rich. The point is, is that Jesus is saying to all of us who are humble, to all of us who would trust Jesus, to all of us who would be dependent on God as our sufficiency, as our sustenance, as our provider. For all who are humble, Jesus says, I will reward you. I will honor you. I will take care of you. Don't miss the picture here. There are rewards before and after they die. The difference is, before they die, the rewards belong to the wealthy man. He had everything he wanted when they crossed over to the other side, so to speak. The rewards are completely reversed. God bestows honor and Instead of us having to acquire the honor for ourselves. God says to all who are humble, that if you would trust me, that if you would lean into me, if I would be the source of your joy and satisfaction, if you would trust me, no matter what this life may bring, no matter how much you have or don't have, I will take care of you. I will reward you. Humility is the picture here. We need to see this. One last picture, Luke 18. Luke 18. In this story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. We pick up in verse 35. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Hearing a crowd pass by, he inquired what was happening. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, they said. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those in the front told him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came closer, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Receive your sight, Jesus told him. Your faith has saved you. And instantly he could see. And he began to follow him, glorifying God. All the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. We've seen Jesus take someone who was dirty and make them clean. We've seen some, Jesus take someone who was rejected and made them accepted. We've seen Jesus take someone that was lost and brought them in. We saw Jesus take someone who was poor and made them rich. Now I want you to see Jesus taking someone who is blind and making them see. This guy is mentioned as being Bartimaeus in Mark's account. He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here he is, blind. And as a result of his blindness, he is resorting to begging on the side of the street. You couldn't do anything else if you were blind in this particular culture. So he's sitting there and he's begging and he hears that Jesus is coming by and he starts to scream and create this commotion. The crowds try to quiet him and he screams even more louder, Jesus, have mercy on me. I want you to see this picture. Jesus literally again says one word. He says, see. All of a sudden this man's sight is restored. I want you to see not just the physical picture here, but also the picture underneath the picture. To all of us who need healing, Jesus says, I will reveal myself to you. 
I will reveal myself to you. Don't miss the play on sight in this passage. This is at the point where Jesus is about to go to the cross and people are wondering, who is this Jesus and should we believe in him? These people who can see doubt who Jesus is. And then all of a sudden you have a blind man who can't see Jesus, who knows exactly who Jesus is. And he yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He calls out for his healing and Jesus says, I will reveal myself to you. Your faith has healed you. Jesus brings light in the middle of the darkness. He shows himself clearly to this man. And the beautiful picture is that this man goes from being on the side of the road begging. And when you get to the end of the passage, it says he's walking alongside Jesus, praising God. His life is completely transformed as a result of his disease, as a result of his blindness. He was able to see Christ for who he really was. And that brought complete healing to him. Now walking alongside Jesus, praising God, being able to see. Jesus reverses our status. Five different examples here. From dirty to clean. From rejected to accepted. From lost to found. From poor to rich. From blind to seeing. All throughout the book of Luke, Jesus speaks into pictures of shame. And he brings honor. He reverses our status. And yet this isn't where the story ends. He not only reverses our status, he redeems our souls. I want you to see the ultimate picture of shame and honor in the book of Luke. It's when Jesus goes to the cross to resurrection. Don't miss the whole message of the cross. The shame of our sin is put onto him. And as he is mocked and as he is beaten, as he is scourged, as he is spit at, he is nailed to the cross and all of our shame is put on him. He hangs there completely shameful before everyone who passes by. However, God takes the ultimate picture of shame and turns it into the ultimate picture of honor in the resurrection of our Savior. It brings us back all the way back to Luke 4. When Jesus says, I've come to release the oppressed. I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And what's really interesting in this picture is in Isaiah 61 and even further back in Leviticus 25, you see a reference to the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee happens every 50 years. Every 50 years it was declared that during the 50 years, 50th year, everyone who had a debt, the debt would be canceled forever. Everyone who had fallen into hard times and had to become a slave would now become free. And now Jesus comes on the scene in Luke 4 and quotes Isaiah 6, 61. He says, I've come to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He goes to the cross and he dies there. He rises from the grave and what he's saying to all of us who have been held captive by our sin, to all of us who have been oppressed by our sin, in the middle of your shame, I have come to set you free. I've come to release you. You are no longer a slave anymore. You are no longer in bondage anymore, but you are now free once and for all. This is the picture of a gospel in a shame-based culture. Jesus is saying in the middle of our shame, I will release you. I will restore you. I will bring honor back to you. God takes our shame and he turns it into honor. God takes our shame and he turns it into 